Entropy is a measure of the dispersal of energy or microstates, sometimes simplified as the measure of disorder or randomness of a system. It is covered a lot more in depth in chapter 3 of the textbook, but we will take a quick look at it here. Simpler things have lower entropies because they have fewer possible configurations or microstates. The basic trend for elements of the same family is the higher the element's atomic number, the greater its entropy. This is because more electrons provide more variability in positions. The heavier and more complex a molecule is, the greater its compound's entropy. The entropy of a substance is also strongly dependent on its temperature. As we go from solid to liquid to gas, entropy increases because particle motion becomes more random. To observe characteristics of entropy changes, we will go through some example reactions. The first reaction is a synthesis reaction. Initially, we might think entropy decreases because there is a smaller number of particles on the product side. However, the entropy of gases is considerably greater than the entropy of solids or liquids, so the entropy change in reactions involving gases is usually dominated by the increasing or decreasing moles of gas. Here we have one gas molecule becoming two, so the entropy increases. The standard entropies are shown below just to confirm that this is true. The next example has the same number of moles of gas on either side of the equation. There are nine atoms in the three carbon dioxides, while there are only six atoms in the three carbon monoxides, so the entropy decreases. Additionally, we can see all the oxygen is in a gaseous molecule originally, but it becomes part of a solid as well as a gaseous molecule as a product. In this third reaction, the number of gas molecules doesn't change, and neither does the number of atoms that are part of the gas molecules. Well, a group of items has less entropy when the common items are grouped together. Nitrogen and oxygen atoms have less entropy when the like atoms are combined together than when the unlike atoms are combined, so entropy increases. Further, entropy increases when common items split up to form or be part of more groups, such as carbon dioxide and hydrogen gas forming carbon monoxide and water vapor. The oxygen atoms go from being in one molecule to two different molecules. It is important to recognize that a chemical equation alone does not contain enough information for you to reliably determine whether entropy increases or decreases during the reaction. You really need to compare the standard entropies of the reactants and products to do this. However, in the textbook, the entropy problems are restricted to reactions conforming to the general characteristics described here. There are two thermodynamic drives that influence an equilibrium's position. One is the drive towards decreasing enthalpy, Objects naturally adopt the lowest energy state available to them. Chemical reactions tend to proceed in the exothermic direction. The other is the drive towards increasing entropy. Randomly moving objects become disorganized when left on their own. Diffusion, the self-movement of chemicals from an area of high to low concentration, is an example of this tendency towards disorder. For a chemical reaction, if both of these drives are towards the products, the reaction will establish an equilibrium position far to the right. If the drives are both towards reactants, the equilibrium position is far to the left. If the drive towards increasing entropy opposes the drive towards decreasing enthalpy, an equilibrium will develop with a reasonable proportion of both reactants and products. Note that chemical systems move spontaneously towards equilibrium. Spontaneous means that it happens on its own, with no outside intervention. It does not say anything about how quickly it will happen. It should also be emphasized that the College Board prefers the term thermodynamic favorability to spontaneity. The diagram here illustrates the four possible enthalpy-entropy combinations that could occur in a chemical reaction. Remember that when the drives towards enthalpy and entropy are in opposition, equilibrium is established. If they both favor the reaction, then it goes virtually to completion, while if they both oppose the reaction, then there is virtually no reaction. The equilibrium expression is derived in the textbook, but we won't cover the derivation in detail here. In this expression, the equilibrium constant is in terms of the equilibrium concentrations of the reactants and products. The product concentrations are in the numerator, while the reactant concentrations are in the denominator. The concentrations are each raised to the power of their corresponding coefficient in the balanced chemical reaction. The equilibrium constant, Keq, is the numerical value provided by this expression and is temperature dependent. Something else that is very important to be mindful of is that solids and liquids are not included in the equilibrium expression. This has to do with the fact that the concentration of a pure solid or liquid is fixed by its density, while the concentration of a solute is not.
One exception to this is if we have more than one liquid in the chemical equation, the liquids dilute each other. In this case, the liquids are included in the equilibrium expression. Adding or removing solids or liquids or changing the surface area of solids may affect the reaction rate, but will have no effect on the equilibrium concentrations. Now let's actually go about calculating an equilibrium constant. Here we have three gases which are at equilibrium and their concentrations. Notice how these are the concentrations at equilibrium, so we are good to use these directly in our equilibrium expression. We begin by writing down the equilibrium expression. The hydrogen iodide has a coefficient of 2 in the balanced chemical reaction, so its concentration is raised to the power of 2. Now we can insert the equilibrium concentration we were given into the expression. We don't include the units of the equilibrium constants in this course because they vary too much from equation to equation to be useful. What does a bigger equilibrium constant mean? Remember that our equilibrium expression has products in the numerator and reactants in the denominator. This means that the extent of the reaction's progress towards products is indicated by the size of the equilibrium constant. The further a given reaction progresses to the right to achieve equilibrium, the greater its equilibrium constant will be. In addition to knowing what a bigger equilibrium constant means, it is just as important as knowing what it does not mean. We don't want to infer too much from the size of our equilibrium constant. For one thing, it is impossible to infer anything about an equilibrium's position solely from its equilibrium constant. Let's say we have the following equilibrium and the initial concentration of acetic acid is 1.0 moles per liter. If we lower the concentration, say, to 1 times 10 to the negative 6 moles per liter, then there will be a larger yield at equilibrium as the system shifts to restore the lost osmotic pressure. Clearly, the equilibrium position must depend on the initial reactant concentrations as well as the equilibrium constant. Let's say we do have the same initial reactant concentrations for two different reactions. It is still very difficult to make meaningful comparisons between their equilibrium constants unless their expressions have identical forms. Even when they have the same equilibrium constant, they may have radically different percent yields. How about changing the equilibrium constant? If we stress the system by changing any of the concentrations, the new concentrations will not provide the equilibrium constant when plugged into the equilibrium expression. The reaction will shift to restore a set of concentrations that once again provide the equilibrium constant. However, a shift caused by a change in temperature will increase the product concentrations and decrease the reactant concentrations, or vice versa. Therefore, changing temperature is the only way we can change an equilibrium constant. The form in which a chemical equation is written affects its equilibrium expression and constant. Take for example the reaction of hydrogen and oxygen gas forming water vapor. The equilibrium expression for the reaction shown here looks like this. Let's say the concentration of hydrogen is 2 molar while the oxygen is 4 molar and the water vapor is 12 molar. When we plug in these concentrations, we get an equilibrium constant that is 3. What if we double the equilibrium expression? It's the same reaction, but it has a different equilibrium expression and a different constant when the coefficients are doubled. Doubling the equation has the effect of squaring the equilibrium constant. If we take our original equation and reverse it, it inverts the equilibrium expression and constant. The equilibrium constant for any reaction is the reciprocal of the equilibrium constant for its reverse reaction. The equilibrium law is valid for both single-step equilibria and multi-step equilibria. If this reaction is at equilibrium, then step 1 must be at equilibrium to maintain the reactants at a constant concentration, and step 2 must be at equilibrium to maintain the products at a constant concentration. The equilibrium expression for the overall reaction can be derived from the equilibrium expressions for each individual step by multiplying them together. The trial KEQ or reaction quotient Q is the numerical value derived when any set of reactant and product concentrations is plugged into an equilibrium expression. This value can tell us if a reaction is at equilibrium and if not, the direction in which the reaction will proceed to achieve equilibrium. If the trial KEQ is less than the actual equilibrium constant, then the reaction must proceed to the right to achieve equilibrium. The reaction quotient's numerator must increase and its denominator decrease until the quotient itself has risen to equal the equilibrium constant. Likewise, if the trial KEQ is greater than the actual equilibrium constant, then the reaction must proceed to the left to achieve equilibrium. In this question, we have three gases introduced in a closed flask. We need to figure out which direction the reaction will proceed to reach equilibrium. Unlike the problem we solved previously where we were finding the equilibrium constant, we are not being provided with the equilibrium concentrations. 
These are the initial concentrations. To find the reaction quotient, or trial KEQ, we write down the equilibrium expression and then plug in the initial concentrations. We get a reaction quotient equal to 78, which is less than the equilibrium constant. The reaction quotient is too small, so the reaction must make more products. In other words, it will shift right to achieve equilibrium. We are next going to revisit a problem we looked at in chapter 2.3. Before, we used Le Chatelier's principle to determine that the system would proceed to the left to re-establish equilibrium. Now let's verify this by comparing the reaction quotient to the equilibrium constant. We will use the same histogram as before. At the initial equilibrium, we have a hydrogen ion concentration of 6 moles per liter, while the nitrite is 8 moles per liter and the nitrous acid is 12 moles per liter. These concentrations are used to calculate the equilibrium constant. When the system is diluted so its volume is doubled, all the concentrations are halved. The value we get for Q is clearly larger than the equilibrium constant, so the reaction must proceed to the left, decreasing the reaction quotient until it is equal to the equilibrium constant. This agrees with our answer from earlier. The histogram also shows the final concentrations. Let's find the reaction quotient at this point to verify that these are the final equilibrium concentrations. We will call our reaction quotient Q prime just to show it is different from the one we calculated earlier. We see that the concentrations of hydroxide ions and nitrite have risen to 4 and 5 respectively, while the concentration of nitrous acid has decreased further to 5. When we plug these into the expression, we get a value that is equal to the equilibrium constant and have thus verified that the system is back at equilibrium. At this point, we need to make a small add-on to Le Chatelier's principle. Le Chatelier's principle of partially alleviating a stress is based on more than one chemical concentration being involved in the equilibrium process. When an equilibrium removes some of an added chemical, other chemical concentrations also change, which prevents the stressed chemical from reaching its original equilibrium concentration. However, if the equilibrium only involves one chemical concentration, then equilibrium is not re-established until the original concentration is restored. In other words, the stress will be completely alleviated. For example, the equilibrium constant for calcium carbonate decomposing and synthesizing in a closed vessel only depends on the concentration of carbon dioxide. The solids are not included in the expression. If this system is stressed by removing some of the carbon dioxide, then the entire loss must be replaced to restore the reaction quotient back to the equilibrium constant. We're now going to take a look at an example of an equilibrium system, just to review the concepts we have covered so far in this chapter. It's the system involving nitrogen dioxide and dinitrogen tetroxide, which we have previously looked at. What is shown here is basically snapshots of this system as it proceeds to equilibrium from either direction. On the far left, we have only reactants, so the reaction quotient would be equal to zero. On the far right, we have only products and no reactants, so the reaction quotient would be infinite. Shown below the vessels are arrows representing the forward and reverse reaction rates. If we began with only reactant molecules, then the forward reaction rate would start out high and decrease, while the reverse rate would increase. Once these rates become equal, then the system would be at equilibrium. Let's take the mixture that is at equilibrium and add some nitrogen dioxide. This disrupts the equilibrium and now the reaction quotient does not equal the equilibrium constant. The reaction shifts right to remove some of the added reactant. If we were to make a concentration versus time graph, this addition would appear as a spike on the graph. The concentration of the nitrogen dioxide would decrease twice as much as the concentration of dinitrogen tetroxide would increase, until equilibrium is re-established and the reaction quotient is once again equal to the equilibrium constant. How about we make a change to the volume, say by shrinking this vessel? The reactant and product concentrations have both increased and the reaction will proceed to the side with fewer gas particles. In this case, the reaction shifts right, converting nitrogen dioxide to dinitrogen tetroxide. On a concentration versus time graph, we would observe that all the concentrations suddenly increase and then continue to change until equilibrium is established. There are three related values in any chemical system that develops in equilibrium. The equilibrium constant, the initial concentrations, and the equilibrium concentrations. In equilibrium problems, you are given two of these values and asked to find a third. There are only two chemical concepts used to solve equilibrium problems. One is reaction stoichiometry, the mole ratio in which the reactants are consumed and the products are formed. 
the coefficients in the balanced chemical equation provide these mole ratios. The other concept is the equilibrium law, the relationship between the equilibrium constant and any set of equilibrium concentrations. The first type of problem we will look at is one where we are given the initial concentrations and one equilibrium concentration. Initially, there are 7 moles of ammonia in a 0.5 liter flask, and no moles of nitrogen or hydrogen yet. We are told that the concentration of nitrogen at equilibrium is 6.2 moles per liter. We need to create an ice table, which stands for initial concentrations, changing concentrations, and equilibrium concentrations. To get the initial concentration of ammonia, we divide 7 moles by 0.5 liters. We finish filling in the initial concentrations, and we can also put in the equilibrium concentration of the nitrogen. Evidently, positive 6.2 should go in the change spot for the nitrogen, as we have gone from 0 to 6.2. The mole ratio in the balanced chemical equation is used to relate the moles of the reactants and products consumed or produced. For every one mole of nitrogen produced, 2 moles of ammonia are consumed and 3 moles of hydrogen are produced. When these changes are filled in, the equilibrium concentrations can be calculated. The next thing to do is to write out our equilibrium expression for the reaction. Once the equilibrium concentrations are inserted into the expression, we get the equilibrium constant. In this next problem, the hydrogen, chlorine, and hydrogen chloride are at equilibrium, but an additional 15 moles of hydrogen chloride are inserted into the flask. Remembering Le Chatelier's principle, we know an increase in the product concentrations is going to cause a shift left. We are asked to find the concentration of chlorine when equilibrium is re-established. Initially, it might seem like we do not have enough information to solve the problem. The question never gave us the equilibrium constant. Or did it? We have all the concentrations at the original equilibrium, so we can use those to find the equilibrium constant. With the initial concentrations and the equilibrium concentrations, we will be able to find the concentrations at the re-established equilibrium. Let's first get organized by making ourselves an ice table. This time we've included an extra row, which is the initial equilibrium concentrations. If we write our equilibrium expression and plug these initial concentrations in, the equilibrium constant can be determined. We will use this later on. For now, let's finish filling out the table. 15 moles of hydrogen chloride in 3 liters is 5 moles per liter. Adding this to the initial equilibrium concentration, we get 8 moles per liter. The concentrations of hydrogen and chlorine have not changed yet. Since the product concentrations have been increased, the reaction is going to shift to the left. We don't know how much product was consumed or how much of the reactants was produced, so we put in a variable. Remember to take note of the mole ratio. Hydrogen and chlorine will increase by x, while the concentration of hydrogen chloride will decrease by twice as much. We can then write down the final equilibrium concentrations by adding the changing concentrations to the initial concentrations. We can once again write down the equilibrium expression and insert the final equilibrium concentrations. We know what the equilibrium constant is, so we only have one variable to solve for. There is something that we should really do here to make our lives easier. For this equation, if we take the square root of both sides, we will not have to deal with an x squared. This is great, because if we didn't do this, we would end up having to use the quadratic formula. That would work too, but say if a question like this came up on a test where we were facing a time constraint, then we would probably want to solve the question the more efficient way. Next we just do some rearranging and algebra to find x, which turns out to be 2 moles per liter. But be careful, this is not our final answer as x is not equal to the final equilibrium concentration of chlorine. Remember that the concentration of chlorine established at the new equilibrium is equal to 6 moles per liter plus x. After we have found our answer, it is a very good idea to check it by substituting our value for x back into the equilibrium expression. If it doesn't work, then it indicates we've made a mistake somewhere. When we plug in 2 moles per liter for x here, we do indeed get 0 0.250. Now for our third and final one of these problems. This time we are given the equilibrium concentrations and the equilibrium constant, and need to find the initial concentration of the oxygen. In contrast to the previous problems, this time we need to travel back into the past to determine what initial concentrations would have resulted in the current equilibrium concentrations. Just as before, we can begin by setting up an ice box. We know the equilibrium concentrations of sulfur dioxide and oxygen. Originally, it was just sulfur dioxide and oxygen that were injected into the flask, so the initial concentration of sulfur trioxide was zero. Since there were no products initially, the reaction had to proceed to the right, 
Using the mole ratio and the balanced chemical equation, we can figure out the concentration changes in terms of an unknown x. This also allows us to write down the expressions for the final concentration of the sulfur trioxide and also the initial concentrations of the reactants. Once we write the equilibrium expression, we plug in the equilibrium concentrations and solve for x. We aren't done yet. The initial concentration of oxygen is 0.040 moles per liter plus x. Now we have our answer. We may also want to verify the value of x by plugging it back into our equilibrium expression. The equilibrium position of a reaction is characterized by a mathematical value often referred to as the mass action expression. It is shown here for this reaction. Note that the A stands for the activity of each species. The activity can be represented by concentration or by partial pressure if all the species are gases. The mass action expression is called an equilibrium constant Kc when the activities represent concentrations at equilibrium. If the activities are partial pressures, and the system is at equilibrium, the expression is called an equilibrium constant but is known as Kp. Kp should always be calculated using atmospheres. Usually the values of Kc and Kp are different. We can see the relationship between them by rearranging the ideal gas law and substituting in the concentration for moles over volume. The relationship is as follows, where the change in moles is the sum of the coefficients for the gaseous products minus the sum of the coefficients for the gaseous reactants. Note that if there is no change in the moles of gas, then the gas constant times the temperature is to the power of zero, and Kp equals Kc. You're using units of atmosphere, so the gas constant value we use is 0.08206 liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin. Evidently, we should also be using the Kelvin temperature. In this problem, we are given an equilibrium reaction and the gas concentrations, and are asked to determine both Kc and Kp. First, we can find Kc by writing down the equilibrium expression and plugging in the concentrations. Next, we can use our new expression to convert it to the Kp value. The temperature is given as 498 Kelvin, and we have 2 moles of gaseous products and 4 moles of gaseous reactants. Plugging these in allows us to find the Kp value. Here we have a sample of phosphorus pentachloride decomposing into phosphorus trichloride and chlorine. We are given the initial total pressure and the total pressure at equilibrium. We are also assuming that the temperature is constant. The first thing we must do is determine the partial pressure of each gas at equilibrium. Right away we see that the pressure increases as the reaction reaches equilibrium. Why is this the case? The system proceeds to the right to reach equilibrium and one mole of gas will become two moles. This means the pressure will be greater. Let's use an ice box to find expressions for the partial pressures of the gases. The table works in essentially the same way as it did when we were putting in concentrations earlier. Initially, the partial pressure of the phosphorus pentachloride was two atmospheres. The partial pressures of the phosphorus trichloride and chlorine were zero. The reaction will proceed to the right and we can write down the change in partial pressure as x. This allows us to determine the expressions for the equilibrium partial pressures. But what should we do next seeing as we don't have an equilibrium constant? Recall Dalton's law of partial pressures, which says that the total pressure is equal to the sum of the partial pressures of the individual gases. This means the sum of the partial pressures of our three gases will be equal to the total pressure, which we know to be 2.61 atmospheres. We only have one unknown to determine, and then we can write down the partial pressure for each gas. Next we need to find Kp, so we just plug our equilibrium partial pressures into the equilibrium expression. Finally, if a decomposition went to completion, what would be the total pressure in the system? Filling out an ICF box is one way we can determine the final partial pressures. We know that since all the phosphorus pentachloride will react, its final partial pressure will be zero. Adding these final partial pressures together will give the total pressure of the system.